Welcome back to the fighter versus the writer. I am Damon Mart. It is officially UFC 300 week. Feels like we've been, build, been building to this moment for like two years now, but it is finally here. UFC 300 week is here. Uh, of course, my regular co-host Matt Brown will be with us shortly. He's running a little bit late, but so for such a big event, such a monumental event, I could not just go with just me and Matt. I had to bring in a very special guest to help me talk about some of the biggest storylines, some of the biggest moments at UFC 300. She is one of the top commentators in the game, one of the top analysts in the game. And as Alan Joban famously said on this podcast a couple weeks ago, she is the unicorn of the UFC because she does it all. <laughs> it is my pleasure to welcome in Laura Sanka. Laura, how are you? Thank you so much, Damon. I appreciate it. I'm good. And uh, did did Matt like did Matt thrash out that intro song? Because that's awesome. <laughs> That yeah, that was actually so. Matt actually has his own intro song, but I don't play it on the show because I'm afraid we're going to get copyright strikes. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, he actually he actually has uh, Jamie Jasta from Hatebreed made his own song for him, but I'm always afraid we're going to get like copyright strikes, so I don't play it on the show. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I mean, I can't think of a a, a bigger week. I mean, it is it's overwhelming already, but overwhelming in a good way. We're going to get through this, and it's going to be incredible. It's uh, it's such an uh, I mean I mean it's a ridiculous card I mean there's just it's an absolutely ridiculous card like I knew we all kind of knew UFC 300 was going to be big and you know I know listen I know some people maybe not loving the main event I get it it's not the fight that everyone thought it was going to be but I've joked and I've said unless they announced Khabib Nurmagomedov against George St Pierre no one was exactly. going to be satisfied but. Cody Garbrandt and Devison Figueroa are opening the prelims that is ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when you have two former champions opening the prelims, I think that tells you everything you need to know about a card like this. You know, 12 former or current belt holders on this card. Seven people listed in the pound-for-pound pound rankings. You've got 10% of the people who have ever per held a UFC belt. 10% of UFC champions ever <laughs> are on this card. That is an insane statistic. When Michael Carroll put that out there, I was like, "That the math ain't math and but on that, but I'm sure it's true and I love it. That's so crazy." Yeah. So I'm curious, Laura, before we get into anything else cuz I mentioned it at the top and you know, I don't want to restate the conversation cuz I had Michael Bisping on last week talking about this card and you know, listen. I think the main event's fine. I like Alex Pereira and and Jamal Hill. It's a great fight, but as I said, Unless they announce like a triple threat match where they were going to bring back the ghost of Bruce Lee or something, people were going to find a way to complain about something because yeah. that's just, this is such a built up card. We get it, but I, I'm fine with the main event. And I think when you look at this card top to bottom, like, how can you actually complain about this? Seriously? Like this is this, there's not a single bad fight on this card. There's not a single fight that you can look at and say, you know what? This is where I'm going to go grab a drink, get some popcorn. There's no breaks in this card. 100%. 100%. The, 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 in totality, this is the best card that has ever been. And people just need to recognize that and give it its due. In terms of the main event, have there big, been bigger main events? Absolutely. You know, I think a lot of people got their hopes up for a Connor or a John or some rabbit trick, like you mentioned, whether it would be Khabib versus GSP or whatever. But listen, still, this main event still has a lot of really important implications. The man is here. We got to <laughs> recognize him. I made it finally. What's up, Matt? But I'm still, I'm still got wiping the sweat off from training. <laughs> that's, As you uh, should. <laughs> that's commitment right there. When you come in sweating for the podcast, exactly. Yeah. Well, you got you guys are on short time. <laughs> we uh, we just got into it, Matt. Obviously, we're talking. We just started things off. I know we've talked about a little bit about the main event, and you know how you know. I think in a way, there were almost unrealistic expectations for this main event, but. I think ultimately, listen, you know, this is just, this is a card that as, as Laura said, in totality, it's so ridiculous. How could you complain about anything? Like they could literally make, uh, Justin Gaethje, Max Holloway, the main event. They could make Charles Oliveira, Armin Saruki in the main event. Like there's like nine different main events on this card. And I don't think you could really complain. Yeah. I love it, man. It's, it's all main events all night and better than any apex main event we've had in the last couple months. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these could all be pay-per-views. So you you know, we complain about the price of pay-per-views, but damn, bro, like there's you getting like 10 and 1 here. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So listen, it would be impossible in the time we have to break down every fight in this card. This would be a five hour long podcast to actually break down all 13 fights in this card. So we're gonna kind of dig into some storylines, some of the biggest moments we're looking forward to. And let me ask the biggest softball question ever to start this podcast for you, Laura, since you are coming in and join us. 
I know maybe it's not a softball question because this is probably going to be tough because there are 13 fights. But what is is there one fight on this card you're most looking forward to? Maybe the, I almost say under the radar. Just obviously we all know the title fights, the BMF fight. But is there one fight in particular you're just like super excited about for this card? There, there are. I mean, yeah, there, there, there are a lot of fights that I'm super excited about in this card. I actually think that the uh, Yuri Prohashka versus uh, Alexander Rockich mm-hmm. fight is really going under the radar. I've been a huge fan of Rockett in particular for a very long time. Um, and I'm excited to see him coming back finally from that injury, I think injects a, a whole new dimension into the light heavyweight division. But for me, uh, and it's not that it's going under the radar, but I think in a card this stacked, lots of things feel like maybe they're not getting the, the all the attention they're due. And it's just, that's the story of Kayla Harrison coming to the UFC. And I cannot overstate um, how big of a fan I am of her in terms of not just her finding, but her as a human being. She's just an awesome person. And listen, the Bantamweight division needs someone like Kayla Harrison to come in here and shake it up. And quite frankly, women's MMA in the UFC right now needs a little bit of a breath of fresh air. And hopefully she could come out here, make that insanely difficult cut and not have it affect her too much in the fight and make good on, I think, the uh, the idea that a lot of people have for her, what she can do in the UFC. Matt, I know you, so we talked about the weight cut and obviously you said, you know, no matter what you do for a weight cut, it's never going to be easy, but could, will we, will we see, will we kind of figure, well, I mean, we can't really figure things out until Saturday because when Jose Aldo weighed in for the first time at Bantamweight, I was like, man, this was a really bad idea. Yeah. And then he goes out and has a, a brilliant performance the next night. So, I mean, I guess we can't really tell anything about how she's going to look until she gets in the octagon with Holly Holm. Yeah. Has she ever made that weight before? No, she I hasn't. Mean, that's, yeah. That's the question, right? Like, it's probably been since she was in high school since she weighed that much. So mm-hmm. does she even know what she feels like at that weight? You know, and that's not a good feeling walking into a, a fight, um, especially on UFC 300, you know, against another killer. You know, she's not fighting. She's not getting a tune-up fight for her first UFC fight. She's getting Holly freaking home. Yeah. You know, and that's a tough matchup for her all around, even in – um you know, even without the weight cut involved. So this is going to be, that's a very interesting one. One thing I, one thing I always like to inject in, in this particular instance with her is, you know, we've seen the amazing thing she did at the PFL at 155. Obviously the cut is its own thing. It's its own monster, its own war. What I'm excited to see, because I saw it one time when she popped over to Invicta, I called that fight And she had one fight at 145 in Invicta where she was allowed to use elbows. And Matt, you can appreciate this. She can't use elbows in PFL. And I'm telling you what, what she did to that poor woman in Invicta when she was finally able to use elbows when she got on top, she looked like she took a hatchet to the face. I'm excited to see Kayla Harrison with elbows. (laughs) You mentioned she she can get on top of Holly Holm is going to be the question, right? 100%. I mean, that's the story of the fight, right? You know, it's almost a grappler versus striker old school matchup you know everybody these days is good but we know where they're best we know where kayla's best we know where holly's best and who has the best chance of winning in a different position and that's what makes the fight so exciting yeah and can she find holly right in that big in that big you you know pay-per-view size octagon and with holly's incredible footwork and ability to you know stay elusive that could be a real problem for kayla yeah that's an interesting point what's the size of the pfl octagon versus you know i don't know I don't know. It is small. It is smaller. I don't know how much smaller, but it is smaller than the UFC octagon. I'm not sure by how much though. Yeah, because that's an interesting point. Like when I fight at the Apex, I remember I only fought there once, and I was I was shocked at how small the octagon was. I was like, "There's gyms that have bigger (laughs) octagons than this that I train in," and um, I personally I like it. You know, I'm like, "Hell yeah!" Like, stand, put me in a phone booth, let's go. But for some people, like Holly Holm, that's a huge disadvantage. Um, but obviously, you know, she's fighting in the pay-per-view octagon. So yeah, that could be a huge advantage for her. That that's a unspoken little piece or not talked about a lot piece of this puzzle. It's interesting because I, I said this to Holly. I talked to Holly right after the fight was made, and I asked her, you know, she didn't buy into my conspiracy theory, but I said it is interesting that it got Holly versus Kayla. And Holly is the one who sent Rhonda in her first loss. Judo background. I think. Yeah. I think. I think uh, Rhonda and Kayla are different fighters, of course. But I was just at Rhonda's Q and A uh, last night here in Ohio. She was doing her book tour, and you mentioned this division. And listen, I like Raquel Pennington. I do. I think she's awesome. But I think Kayla brings a level of star power that this division is sorely missed. 
kind of since Ronda. And I, I get you know, obviously I don't want to disrespect Amanda Nunes. Amanda was a star in her own right, but Ronda was, you know, she's on another atmosphere, uh, another planet all to herself. But I feel like Kayla's someone need, but listen, that's the thing with the UFC, you know, just like, you know, I know like MVP came in and got Kevin Holland day one and I picked Kevin Holland to win that fight. You, there's no easy fights in the UFC and Holly Holm is incredibly tough. She's hard to hold down. And, you know, she knocked out another bra, another medalist in judo. So they're not giving Kayla Harrison a fight that she's just guaranteed to win. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. That's, you know, Matt, Matt said it best. I mean, that this is, this is a very tough test right out of the gate for her to be facing a former champion and someone who has the footwork, you know, that could really give her, that could really give her some problems. And I love that because that's what the UFC is supposed to be is lions against fucking lions. It's not supposed to be tune up fights. Uh, you know, that's boxing, you know, that's other organizations. Like when you're in the UFC, you know, and, and I've told Sean, show me that from day one for me. I mean, I'm, 43 years old and you know they're like yeah we'll get someone that, that works for you or whatever and i said bro i don't want someone that works for me put a fucking killer in there with me if i can't hang with them they knock me out you know but that's what the ufc is supposed to be in my opinion and that's what one thing i love about it it's what i love about this matchup they're not giving her a pushover they're not building her up to be a star they're saying if, if you want to be at the top you got to fight at the top right away and Laura, you've been around, obviously, championing women's MMA for many years. Of course, you're a fighter yourself. Sorry, Jamie Varner, you got that one wrong. Uh, you are you are incredible in your own right. I'm curious, though, like, and, and, and again, I mean, absolutely, Holly's been around forever. Again, you could argue that, you know, Holly may be the bigger known quantity coming into yeah. this because Kayla's still a bit of an unknown because as we've seen with all the fighters who came over, and I know PFL guys and other organizations are going to get mad when I say this, but the UFC is another level and it, it is, is another level of stardom. You know, Michael Venom page talked about that. Michael Chandler's talked about that. Kayla's coming into this situation here, but it feels like this is kind of what this division needs. Now, again, there's no guarantee she's going to win, but you know, Kayla goes out there and if she can put away Holly Holm, I mean, this just injects a whole new life because I mentioned this on Saturday when Norman Dumont got a win over Jermaine Duran Dammy. I said, yeah, you know, good win. Maybe it wasn't the most exciting fight in the world. Everyone said, well, you know, Juliana Payne is just going to kind of slide in the title fight. And I said, Juliana Payne has been out for almost two years now. Like, if Kayla goes out there and wrecks Holly Holm, beats Holly Holm dominantly, finishes her, I love your point about the elbows. I agree 100%. I think Kayla could slide right in that title fight, and you got a star on your hands. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, I was working the desk last weekend, and before the fights, you know, we, that was the – point that we were all thinking about right like this could this Jermaine Durandamy uh Norma Dumont fight the winner here could be a real injection of of life especially Jermaine Durandamy right like having her come back former champion only had ever lost to Amanda Nunes um and it just didn't it just didn't quite play out you know in in those terms so now we look to Kayla Harrison and what I love about Kayla is not only is she you know capable of going out there and running through people like we've seen her do she's excellent on the mic and there's not, there's a lack of that in women, in women's MMA. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of like the, the vile level of shit talk that we've seen become popular lately. I hate that, but I do think that, you know, you have to be able to seize the moment when you have a microphone and it's part of the business now. And a lot of times the female fighters tend to be, you know, really respectful, which is awesome, but it doesn't always build the biggest fight. So I mean, you put Juliana Pena and Kayla Harrison, and we're already seeing it on Twitter. Those two, those two are going to build a fight if they're if if that's uh, what's in the stars for them. Yeah, absolutely. Let me shift gears because there's just so many storylines going into this one. I know this is kind of an odd question to answer because I think every fight there's something big to win and something big to lose. But I I kind of pose two different questions here for this card: Who has the most to win and who has the most to lose? And I want to start with who has the most to lose. And I'm gonna I'm gonna kick things off and say this, and I'll turn it over to Matt for you next. You know, the most to lose. I mean, listen, everyone has something to lose in this card game. Let me be clear about that. But I look at the landscape of what these fights mean to their particular divisions and every single fight that we have on this card. And I think the person that I identify most at UFC 300 who has the biggest to lose in this card is Justin Gaethje because Justin, hypothetically, he should be in a title fight. I mean, he knocks out Dustin Poirier last year. I thought he was going to slide right in. Of course, disaster strikes. Oliveira gets the cut, ends up being Volkanovski on short notice. Not ideal, but I still thought, okay, they're just going to slide Justin in the title fight. And then he gets announced for Max Holloway at 300. Now, 
all you know, not not to, not to spoil my answer for later in the show. This is my favorite card fight on the card. Like I love Gaethje versus Holloway. This is an incredible fight. I am so excited for this one. But you got Oliveira and Sarukian fighting on the same card, and like it or not, Justin Gaethje's fighting a featherweight coming up to lightweight. If he loses to Max Holloway, it all kind of goes away. I mean, he's not going to be the number one contender, and you got to imagine the winner, Oliveira Saruki, is immediately going to slot in there. You got Dustin Poirier potentially maybe fighting Islam first. To me, the guy with the most to lose at UFC 300 is Justin Gaethje. Matt, what about you? Like, is it is it just you see anyone else on this card that has more to lose in terms of like the stakes of their fight? Yeah, I think Bo Nickel has the most to lose, like easily. I mean, he's you know projected to be a the next big star. He's opening the main card above former champions and guys that you know would have been a main event on most of his cards. Um, you know, he has high expectations of on him. I think he'll probably meet those expectations. I don't think he's going to lose, but if he does go out there and lose to Cody Brundage, I, th- I think that's a really bad way to kick off this card, and I think that's a a really bad way, bad turn in his career. Laura, what about for you? What who do you believe has the most to lose at UFC three hundred? Yeah, I think those are both really strong points. Um, and I don't want to just continue on the same note. I think Kayla Harrison actually has a lot to lose if she comes out here and performs poorly. Like, where do you go? If you don't look at good at 135 or if she misses weight, there is no 145. So that's, you know, certainly high stakes for her. But another one I would say would be Charles Oliveira. You know, he's he's in a position where a big win here puts him right back into that conversation where we know he wants to be um, uh, in terms of facing Islam again, getting that rematch. But I don't know. I, I, I tend to agree with Gaethje. I just didn't want to repeat. I just didn't want to steal your idea. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's so interesting that they put these two fights on the same card because, yeah. you know, Gaethje was the number one contender and then they announced Sarukian and Oliveira as the new number one contenders fight. I think like anything else, I get it. It's hyperbole. We like to hype up fights. I understand that. But ultimately I think it comes down to who looks best, who has the most impressive performance. If Armin can go out there and wreck Charles Oliveira, considering what he did to Islam on short notice in his debut and took him three rounds, very hard three rounds, who wouldn't say that could slot right in for a main event or if Charles could go out there and absolutely demolish Saruki and same kind of thing. And, and the weird thing is the reason, another reason why I said Justin Gaethje, Max Holloway has never been finished by strikes. And I'm not saying it's impossible. Anyone can be finished by strikes, but like notoriously, he's a tough guy to get out of there. So you got to imagine when Gaethje and Holloway are done, it's going to look like they went through a car crash so, you know, no matter how you cut it, like he's probably not going to be ready to fight again right away. And, you know, that's a five round war with a guy again, like it or not. He's a featherweight, all those kind of things. I mean, Gaethje, like I said, I I just there's just a lot on the line. And even when you look at Saruki and, and Oliveira, same kind of thing, like I think style points count. And I think the style of those two fights are, are how we're going to kind of determine who's next. Well, they they definitely count this time in particular because you've got Islam already talking about Dustin Poirier. So if Islam has any say in it, it's Dustin. So all of these guys need to stick out in terms of, of really making a case that they're next. Matt, you have, uh, you have built a style in your career where you're known from going out and put on all action fights. When you look at Gagey and Holloway, like, is that, do you just have to like, I know Gagey has been a little bit more analytical and technical in his last couple of fights, but do you just have to put all that other stuff out of your mind? Like Islam title, all do you, like, cause this is such a, this is such a difficult fight to figure out how it's going to play out. And if you're Gaethje, like, you can't think, like, if I win, I can maybe fight in June, or if I win, I can maybe fight in July. Like, do you just have to go out there and just kind of go balls to the wall and just fight your style and just kind of see where the chips fall where they may? Or do you have to think ahead? Like, how do you deal with that? Because this is a difficult situation for him. No, I think uh, Justin Gaethje's definitely got the right mindset. I don't think he's going to look ahead of Max Holloway at all, and I don't think that would be a good mindset at all. You definitely cannot look ahead of Max Holloway, but you definitely can't look ahead of any fight. Um, I made that mistake before. I think a lot of fighters have probably made that mistake before. You're thinking, um, I'm, you know, in front of the guy that is standing in front of you. You know, that's what matters. And you got to be in the moment. You got to be present. And there's going to be a lot of distractions this week, a lot of media, you know, a lot of hype around this car. He's going to have a lot on his plate to deal with this week. Um, but the biggest thing on his plate is going to be a lot of volume coming from Max Holloway's fist. And that's going to be a major problem if you don't focus on that 100%. Laura, do you, I mean, listen, I, you know, I, I heard a lot of people saying like, this is going to be a great fight. Max is super tough, but I, I generally feel like the consensus has been Justin wins. 
how does Max Holloway win this fight? How do you see Max Holloway finding a way to give Justin Gaethje the kind of problems that could help him win this fight? Well, I mean, I, it, it, Max just has to be Max and find find his flow because we've seen Max when he when he finds his flow state. I don't know if anybody could beat him. I don't care what weight class you are. That moment when he was punching Calvin Cater, started talking to the commentary team, no look right hand, and then dodged the three punches that he wasn't even looking at. That version of Max Holloway definitely has a fantastic chance against Justin Gaethje. And it's it's always going to be a volume game with Max Holloway, death, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts. So while Justin's going to be playing, you know, a game where he's kicking and looking to land bigger shots, Max just has to stay busy, um, you know, definitely check or avoid those leg kicks. That's a big part of any time you step in there with Justin Gaethje, but keep the jab in his face, keep the volume on him, keep the pace high and make this a longer fight. You know, Justin is not a guy who who fades, but no no one lasts like Max Holloway does. No no one does. We we talk about the most to lose, and I know Justin has been very open and said like he's got one more run, one more run at the title. He wants to make one more run at the title. He knows he can't fight forever. Laura, I'm curious. Like we talk about most to lose. Is this like in a, in a, is there is there any scenario where this is kind of do or die for? Not saying like retirement, but a loss to Max Holloway knocks him way back because not only do you have Poirier potentially getting a title shot, which I've said on this show, I'm fine with, like I have no problem if Dustin would slot in and fight Islam in June. Cause nobody else is going to be available. And then you got Oliveira and Saruki and the winner of that's going to be in line. And again, this is a highly evolving sport. Javier Fazib comes back with two Gamrot's out there. I mean, there's all kinds of other things that could happen. Is this kind of a do or die moment for Justin? Like, he can't afford a loss here. I mean, while I, while I agree that he does have the most to to lose in terms, it, the reason he has the most to lose is because he's on the precipice of of having that opportunity yet again. I don't know that this is a full shoots and ladders type of situation where you know you you lose to this guy and you just you just completely fall off the face of the earth. I mean, he just head kicked knockout Justin Gaethje, you know not all that long ago. So we can't erase history, you know, too quickly here for Justin. I don't know. I think I think with his fight style, he's the type of guy where even if and I I favor him in this matchup, but even if he were to lose to Max and even if he were, you know, to get then get a win and then another loss, he's just a guy that is going to always find a way to be relevant at the top of this division, in my opinion, until he's not like it. He's he's fought the who's who and he's proven time and time again that he's still at that level. So even if he doesn't get another run at the title. I think he's going to stay at the top of this division, be entertaining and be making money and be a factor for a long time. What about you, Matt? What do you think? What's on the line here for Justin Gaethje? Is it do or die or am I overselling that a little bit? Man, every fight's do or die. It don't matter, right? Every time you step in there, it feels like it's do or die and it's going to be your last time. Um, I, I differ a little bit. Like I actually favor Max Holloway a little bit in this fight, like, like just barely. Um, mainly because I think like Holloway – is probably the better boxer. Um, it's just a matter of whether he can deal with those big shots of Justin Gagey. Cause you, that's the way I see this fight happening. I don't know how it's going to turn out. You never know with these fights, right? But I see Max Pepper and Pepper and Pepper and punching him up. Justin probably doing this, you know, covering up a little bit, putting his head down. And then he's going to wing some shots. And, but that has to knock out Max Holloway. That's kind of what I see is like he's got to land that shot that really hurts. Max Holloway slows him down, earns that respect. And I think Max is probably just too good for that. So um, I guess that wasn't the question, but that's my opinion on the fight. <laughs> it, it, there's no wrong answer. There's no wrong answer. Now, I, I mentioned who has the most to lose. And I know this is kind of weird reverse of that, which is who has the most to win. Because everyone, again, has something to win here. But I think, you know, I look at some of the fights that are a little under the radar. I think, you know, I think you're, the answer probably is what Laura already said. I think Kayla Harrison has the most to win because obviously she wins here. She may slide right into a title fight and kind of live out her dream and becoming a UFC champion. But I'm going to go a little little further down the card and you know, kind of a weird off-the-cuff answer here in terms of who I think has the most to win here. And I, to me, it's the guy opening the card. It's Cody Garbrandt. Cody Garbrandt coming off his last win. Cody Garbrandt, I know we all talk about this. I was there that night. When he beat Dominic Cruz, that might be one of the three greatest title fight performances of all time, the way he just absolutely styled on Dominic Cruz and did it so beautifully. It was a shocking, stunning, beautiful performance. Unfortunately, he got caught up in those TJ Dillashaw fights and then started questioning, does he still have a chin, had some tough losses, tried flyweight. That didn't work out for him. 
kind of had some ups and downs, comes back and has a couple of good wins in a row. And now we're kind of back on the Cody Garbrandt train a little bit. Devison Figueredo, me and you, Matt, we both pick Rob Font. <laughs> that did not work out well for us. Devison Figueredo out there beat Rob Font. But I think if Cody Garbrandt can find a way to beat Devison Figueredo, doesn't mean he's a title contender immediately. And this, to me, the bantamweight division is so incredibly deep. I'm not saying he's going to be fighting for a belt anytime soon, nor should he fight for a belt anytime soon. But talk about a career resurrection to go out there and beat a guy that I think, again, a lot of people are picking against him. I think this is a great moment for Cody to kind of remind people he's still one of the best guys in the world. So, Laura, I'll throw it to you. Who has the most to win uh, at UFC 300? And again, you could say Kayla because you're not wrong there because that is like, a, he's like <laughs> no. she really does have that. I've talked about Kayla enough. Um, yeah, for me, it's actually Jamal Hill. And I, I, th- I say that because partly, you know, uh, for whatever reason, the public is not uh, in the in the wind in his sails quite yet. And, you know, Facing a guy who has quickly become one of the biggest stars in the UFC in Alex Pereira. And I say that as someone who has witnessed like some of his fan meet and greets, I I can't get over how a guy who speaks very little English, who has only been in the UFC for seven fights, um, has garnered the level of stardom that he has. I mean, I know why, because he's beaten former, you know, four former current champions in that seven fight run. That's a ridiculous run. So my point is that Jamal Hill has an opportunity to knock off a, an all time great here um, if he's able to do it. And I think win over a lot of fans in, in the meantime, you know, coming off of a devastating injury, stepping up here and really being, uh, I don't know the behind the scenes stuff, but it seems like Jamal was the one who kind of made all this happen because they were getting desperate for a main event and Jamal stepping up, coming off of, you know, a long injury layoff, the Achilles tear, all that stuff. It's a big spot for him to be taking on a lot, a lot of pressure on Jamal. And if he can go out there, have a good showing, possibly put Alex Pereira away, that would be a massive win for him. Not only in terms of just getting the belt back that he never lost in the first place, but I think in terms of his own stardom and his own, you know, goodwill with, with the fans. Matt, what about you? So as you were framing that question, Damon, I was first thinking Jamal Hill, but now I can't use that. And then I thought, well, <laughs> Sorry. And maybe uh, Cody Garbrandt. And then you stole that. So I <laughs> said, so now I got to find someone else. And I would say Justin Gagey, right? We, we'd already talked about it. I mean, right, he wins this fight, especially in a good fashion. He probably gets a title shot. And um. Yeah, that's it. I mean, he gets the title shot. Like it, it, like you said, he has a lot on the line. If you got a lot to lose, you, that means you got a lot to win. Mm-hmm. Um, and Justin Gagey was the obvious answer for all those. But I, I totally agree. I think Jamal Hill by far has the most to win here, especially on UFC 300 main fucking event. Yeah. You know, and, and people were kind of hating on the main event, you know, saying it wasn't worthy of the UFC 300. He's got a lot to prove on that. Um you know, to talking about Alex's stardom and, you know, he seems like the invincible guy out there right now. Um, I mean, you can't stress how much Jamal Hill has to win on in this fight. You know, it's funny um, on paper, Jamal Hill, you know, should be pretty you know dead even with Alex considering he's a legit light heavyweight. You know, the fight he had against Glover to share was unbelievable. And of course that is Alex's mentor and, and, and trainer, and Alex, listen, Alex has turned into a legit light heavyweight, but we can't ignore that he was a middleweight. I mean, he is coming up in weight. And so, like, in theory, like, Jamal Hill has advantages in this fight. But, Laura, is am I wrong in thinking it's almost like people are kind of forgetting about Jamal Hill? Like, it's almost like he's the underdog and he's facing, like, this in, these insurmountable odds against And Listen, don't get me wrong. Alex Pereira is a monster. Absolutely is. But, like. I don't think he's that much of an underdog. Like I I'll be honest when this fight got made. And again, when I originally heard about it, I thought it was going to be three or one, maybe that extra month of time on the Achilles, maybe would have made me feel a little bit better about this. But when this fight first got made, I lean Jamal Hill picking this fight. He has real power in his hands. He's a legit big light heavyweight size wise. He's going to match up really well with, with Alex. And we've seen Alex's chin get touched. You know, Israel knocked mm-hmm. him out. Can't deny that. Like, but it feels like it's almost like an afterthought. Like, we're just waiting. Like, we're going to crown Alex champion and just kind of like, what's his next defense going to be? Yeah, I think I think people have yet to really fully respect the skill set of Jamal Hill. And it's kind of a shame because the man has more than proven what he's capable of doing in there. You know, I there's a 
I will say there's there's a there's a rawness and an edge to the way that he strikes in comparison to Alex Pereira, but that doesn't make it any less effective. In fact, I think you know in facing a guy like Pereira, sometimes if you've got a little bit of that edge, it can be an edge in in a fight like that. You know, Pereira has shown that he can take down the greatest technicians, the Izzy's of the world, um, but. When you get a guy like Jamal Hill, who's an absolute dog, who has real power, who fights well out of both stances, and like I said, does not get enough credit for the finer pieces of his of his technique, like his footwork, like his fight IQ. The reads that he was making on Glover to share were pretty impressive, honestly. And you know the way that he was able to get past the chaotic striking style of Yuri Prohashka knocked him out. You know, I I think. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I think, I think Jamal, Jamal brings a lot, uh, a lot to the table, a lot to the table. Yeah. It's, it's, th- it's that was Pereira that knocks, not, 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 yeah, Pereira, yeah, Pereira, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but it is, it is, it is interesting. And like, I know Jamal seems like, and it, I know some guys operate better than this. And maybe Matt, you can speak to this. Cause you know, like you're obviously fighting at this level in the UFC. You've been around for a while. It seems like Jamal always fights with a chip on his shoulder, even though he's been champion. He's been a top guy. It seems like he always fights with a bit of a chip on his shoulder. Like people keep doubting him and it almost like that fuels him. Uh, does, is that, can that help or hurt him in a fight like this where he kind of has that almost like a, something to prove in every time he fights? Yeah. You have to live and train like that. If you don't have that chip on your shoulder, you're probably, you know, you're on your way out. Right. Um, but it, you know, to kind of add what Laura was saying there, you know, it's kind of interesting the way Jamal Hill is, we don't see those finer intricacies of his, we don't respect the intricacies of his style um, because he's so athletic and he's got so much power. And, you know, he has these things that we see that are obvious and clear, but a lot of the finer things kind of get missed. And I think it's actually a tough matchup for Pereira because like Pereira is also not really technical. Like people way overhype how technical Alex Pereira is. He's a gigantic human being. (laughs) <laughs> he is a big 205er. Like, you ever go stand next to the son of a bitch? Like, he is huge. I mean, he's bigger than most 205ers that I know. Um, and, and that goes a long way. And he has, like, enough technique. And he has techniques that work for him. Um, I actually, <clears throat> excuse me, I actually watched part of his uh, striking instructional on dynamic striking. And I was like, dude, th- this stuff is ridiculous. Like, he looks terrible doing this. And there's there's no like like breakdown. It's just like no hit like this and kick like this. And it's like, dude, you do that, not us. <laughs> um, but anyway, you know the point is like he's rough around the edges, but it works great for him. And I think someone like Jamal Hill can go exploit that because he's a little rough around the edges too. These guys aren't uh, you know technical strikers. You know that that doesn't mean they're not great strikers. You know that there's untechnical guys. Uh, like Phoenix, Felix Trinidad, right, or, or Ricardo Mayorga, right, guys, you know, that, that get to a very, very high level, get championship belts without technical striking. They just don't reach, like, the, you know, the Floyd Mayweather status, things like that. But that plays well into Jamal's game. And Alex isn't going up against a small guy now. He's not going – or an uh, undersized guy. So I think that's going to play pretty well into Jamal's game. Yeah, and I think also, like you mentioned, like the untechnical thing, like I think that's kind of what backfired against Yuri Prohoshka because Yuri's a guy who kind of operates on the fly, doesn't do everything technically great, but he's just so wild that he catches you. I mean, look at, I mean, again, up until, up until, you know, when he won the title, even when he won the title, like he didn't win every second of his fight with Dominic Reyes. He knocked him out, but he didn't win every second. Same with Vulcan Osdemir. Like Yuri has that style where he kind of puts himself in danger and it backfired against a, a, a dangerous, nasty guy like, like Alex, you just wonder, like the one fight Jamal had where he lost, it was on the ground. He lost to Paul Craig. He got his arm broken outside of that. He's looked incredible. And so, yeah, like I, again, I do have, I do have a little worry about the, the, the Achilles. Cause you know, it's mm-hmm. typically, a, you know, typically an injury you have to do, you know, six to nine months of recovery. And I, I did the math and he's right at about nine months right now. And so like, is he coming back a little early? Is it too soon? I don't know. I mean, Aaron Rodgers was hopping around a football field trying to come back after five months or whatever. So who knows? But I don't know. Just in this sport like this, it always worries me when guys try to come back too early from like that kind of an injury. But, you know, maybe I mean, maybe he's not worried about grappling and trying to, you know, use the leg for that kind of stuff. I don't know. It's it's a fascinating fight. I don't care what people say about the main event. It's a fascinating fight uh, all the way around. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. 
You do have to worry about the leg kicks, though. That's the one thing that, that I think probably sticks out the most to me for Jamal in terms of like the health of his his calf in particular. I mean, I wouldn't want to be facing one of the best calf kickers, although it it's not his lead leg because he's predominantly south, southpaw, but still, I mean, he switches a lot. So it's it's going to get tagged up, although, you know, you have to assume that he wouldn't be taking this opportunity on if he didn't feel good about it. So, yeah. Um, well, that, that, well, I was going to say, that would be my question. Like, is he taking it because he feels ready or it's fucking UFC 300? Exactly. Main, like, like, you don't care if you're ready or not. Like, you're getting the fight on UFC 300 main event against Alex Pereira. Like, they could call you the night before with a torn Achilles. And you're like, dude, I'm in. Let's go. Yeah. So it's a real thing. Like I said, I mean, they were going to fight at 301, which is, you know, it's three weeks later. It's not a huge amount of time, but. Time is time. I mean, you know, that's the difference between, you know, making weight or not making weight or, or a lot of things in three weeks. So uh, it is intriguing. But I, I still kind of, I don't know. Maybe I'm just, I've, I've lived and died on the Jamal Hill hype train, even after, you know, he he was injured now. And I was like, man, I still think this guy is like the best in the world. I still had him ranked number one for me, light heavyweight wise. And um, maybe I'm just living and dying on that hill until it's too late. But I think this is going to be a really interesting fight for him. One one storyline we had, I, and I, again, there's so many storylines in this card, it's impossible to touch on every one, so I'm trying to get around to some of the ones that maybe people aren't buzzing about quite as much off the main card, but Aljamain Sterling is making his featherweight debut on this card, and they did not give him an easy test. Calvin Cater is incredibly tough. He's a big featherweight. Of course, he's coming back from an ACL tear in his own right, but Aljamain, you know, Aljamain, you could argue, is the greatest bantamweight of all time. He did lose to Sean O'Malley. Of course, it's a tough loss, but I kind of found it weird that the UFC kind of decided to put him in there against Cater and not, and it's not a knock on Calvin Cater. I like Calvin Cater very much, but like they didn't try to give him Ortega or Yair or one of the other top three or four guys. Like I thought Aljamain and Max Holloway would have been interesting until you know, they announced Max's fight. Cause typically a, a long reigning champion changes weight classes. They get a little bit of consideration. He didn't really get that. I mean, Calvin's a top 10 guy, no mistake about it, but like he didn't really get that. So Laura, I'm curious, like, I'm not going to stick on this who has the most to win or lose, but like Aljamain Sterling's got a lot riding on this fight because I don't think he can really just slide right back in a bantam way with Mirab getting the title shot. And yeah. he's not getting Ortega or you know, Volkanovsky. He's not getting one of the like top three or four guys. Like this is a guy who's like on the fringe, like nine, 10, eight, somewhere around together for Calvin Cater, I think. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And those other names you mentioned would be sort of like forgivable losses, right? You know, Okay, so maybe he loses to Ortega, you know, by submission, you know, oh, of course, you know, that he got caught, whatever. But you know, this, like you say, this is the type of fight that's hard enough where he's really, really going to be pushed and challenged um, and yet not glamorous enough in terms of, you know, this is not a a, a top three guy. So it's a, st- it's a very tough spot to be in. Calvin Cater's got phenomenal boxing, phenomenal pace. Um, I, I think we're going to see Aljo really look to, you know, use the grappling, get the backpack going. Um, I'm excited to see him at 145 though. I, I'm trying to remember when it was, but I did a, I did like a fan Q and a with him and I've seen him in person many times, but it was like the first time I had seen him in person when he was in that mentality of like, I'm going to 45. It's a big dude. He's a big, big dude. He's one of those guys. Like when I see Michael Chiesa, like, I don't know how you ever made 140, 155. Like, you're 6'2", and you're not skinny. I think that about Alger. Like, I don't know how you ever made Bantamweight so consistently. I think he's going to find a, a really good home here at 145. Matt, you you obviously come from the striking background. That's kind of Calvin Cater's background. But we saw when Aljamain fought, who I think is one of the best strikers in the world of Bantamweight, Corey Sandhagen, took him down, choked him out in three minutes or whatever. What is the, like, what's the key? I mean, I, I guess we would say the key is don't get taken down, but I mean, Calvin Cater is a, a big, physically strong featherweight. Like they did not give, even though they didn't give him one of the top three guys in the world, they did give him a pretty tough matchup here. Yeah. The key for Calvin, I think is to be patient because Al Jermaine has very awkward striking. Um, it, it, you know, it seems to be like, okay, but it's very awkward and he makes mistakes on the feet. So if Calvin, tries to push a pace or tries to reach for something that isn't there and exposes himself to a potential takedown. Obviously that's going to be a tough night for him. You know, how hard it is to get up against Al Jermaine, how much of a backpack he is. And, you know, it could potentially turn into a very boring fight, which is unfortunate for this card. Cause I think every fight has the potential to be exciting. Um, but it, it, if you're Al Jermaine Sterling, you want this to be a boring fight because Calvin's going to sit there and, try to peck away at you for about uh, 15 minutes out of those 15 minutes. So you better be 
you know, really patient and allow things to happen and, and wait for Al Jermaine to make that mistake where he has to get a takedown, even if you're kind of being more defensive and, um, you know, it's just, a, it's going to be a patience game, you know, you, you can't get too excited with Al Jermaine. Yeah, I think Al Jermaine, I mean, I think Al Jermaine, you know, we saw the mistake he made against Sean, Sean O'Malley again, no shame now, but I think a lot of people at the time were a little surprised because Al Jermaine had been so dominant at that point. You can't make that same mistake against Calvin Cater either. Cause again, when you go up and wait, guys hit harder. I mean, you know, Matt, I know you said like you could fight at middleweight, but you, you know, you're better suited for Welton, but you could fight at middleweight. And I know you said, Laura, during your fighting career, like if, if UFC had had a 105 pound division, you would have fought in the UFC, but fighting one, like even fight for you fighting 115, like that wasn't your natural weight, but that's where you had to fight because that's the only fight you could get. Like that you deal with different power, different strength. So again, I agree. I think Aljamain's a very big guy, but again, he gets hit one time by featherweight. That is different power at featherweight. Yeah, it is. It's definitely, you know, especially when you're talking about like percentage of body weight, I think that is one of the, it's one of the bigger jumps, you know, that you make in terms of when, where guys uh, carry, you know, how guys carry their power, I should say. So yeah, Aljo's going to need to be very careful. And I think though that a lot of times fighters that we see have those really tough losses where it was an obvious lapse in judgment they're so much better after that because they shore up that hole so well. It's like sh after Sean Strickland got knocked out by Pereira, you know, his defense got even more proficient because it's like, you know, fuck, I'm, or excuse me, <laughs> I don't ever want that to happen again, right? So you go back, you double down your efforts in terms of that. So he's an even more dangerous guy um, having suffered that loss to Sean. We do not, we do not bleep on this show, Laura. You can bleep. You I didn't know. I should have asked the rules before we started. <laughs> I, it's Matt, I'm on. A, I do a podcast with Matt Brown. Do you really think we censor this show, Laura? Come I mean, on. I assume. I, I, I didn't want to be. I didn't. I didn't want to be the only one dropping the f bomb. <laughs> have I not dropped any f bombs yet? That's not yet. Impressive. Not yet. I'm, I'm I'm growing up a little bit. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I, I want to shift back to Matt's answer from earlier? Cause one thing we really haven't talked about is, is Bo nickel. You know, I know there were some complaints about him being on the main card. I don't think it's a problem. I think it's perfectly fine. I, you know, Bo nickel's a star on the rise. And when you do a card of this size, I think you'd almost do a disservice by having Bo on the prelims or on the early prelims, you put him on the main card because you want people to watch Bo nickel people who maybe don't know Bo nickel. Although it seems like he's becoming a pretty big star. And let's be honest, he's a massive favorite. I don't know the odds, but I have to imagine they're like astronomically in his favor. And I talked to Cody Brundage last week and Cody said, I know the narrative. Like, I understand. Like they, they're setting this up. He's like, I don't even know if the UFC thinks this is going to be a competitive fight. Um, <laughs> Laura, I'm curious because there's so, and listen, I'm the guy who said very famously, like two fights into his career. I was like, I think he could beat Israel Adesanya right now. I was speaking a little crazy. I understand that, but like, I have a lot of faith in Bo Nickel. I have a lot of faith in Bo Nickel, but how big is this showcase for Bo to go out there? Cause like, to me, he has, he has basically five and a half minutes of total cage time in his entire MMA career. Like, he can't just go out and beat Cody Brundage, right? Like he has to go out there and demolish this guy and kind of do what he's done his first couple of fights, right? Like he can't slip through a three round decision or, you know, like he can't just have a normal fight, right? Like he's got to go out there and just blow this guy out of the water. Yeah, you nailed it. I mean, the the expectations are are completely different in terms of this is not just about winning a fight. It's you have to win in a very particular way because of the opponent, because of the odds, right? And anybody who's watched Cody Brunage fight knows that this is this is the odds on this are kind of ridiculous. Frankly, they shouldn't, these odds shouldn't exist in MMA period because of the nature of the sport. I mean, it's literally uh, you know, a fought a sport that's fought on a razor's edge. Anyone can get knocked out at any time by about anyone. And we all know that. So the odds are kind of crazy, but you know, this is in fact a fight where Bo has to go out and he, and he has to deliver it because he's, he has a different, you know, he's got a different lens. He's got a different microscope on him in terms of everything he does. Like, you know, we're going to dissect, I'm trying to remember what it was. I think he was trying to set up a Darce and it was, or it had an arm. I couldn't remember what it was, but there were, there were things that people felt like he wasn't doing properly or quickly enough or, you know, literally down to the, you know, the minutia of, Oh, is he checking the list in terms of how he sets up his submissions? You know, they they dissect everything he does because he has had the marketing machine at his back from day one. Now, I don't have a problem at all with him being on the main card because the reality is that the UFC uses very easy metrics to figure out where to put people on cards. Other than the champions at the top, it has to do with whether you move the needle. And a lot of that is social media, it's views, 
It's when we put up a video about you, you know, what type of, you know, interaction does it get? What type of viewership does it get? So he's earned his spot on, on the main event. And the kid has a very high bar uh, to live up to. It's, it's a tough spot to be in, but he's, he's the ultimate competitor and he's, he's been competing his entire life. So I think it's kind of where he shines, but he's got a, he's got a live, a live fighter across from him and Cody Brunnage, who, by the way, is a pretty damn good wrestler himself. Wait, what are the uh, odds in this fight? I need to look them up, but they're stupid. Whatever they they're, are, they're they're way like it's insane. Oh, okay. Yeah, Cody Cody came from wrestling. He was a, I think a high school wrestling champion and went to college. Like he's not a bum in wrestling. He's a good yeah. wrestler. And what listen, what Cody told me is true because I asked him about this and he said the reason why I think they made this fight is because I'm so wildly inconsistent. On my best night, yeah. I look great. On my worst night, I look terrible. And I was like, I appreciate that level of honesty. He's like, I understand that. He's like, on my best, on my worst nights, I've had really bad losses. So Matt. Listen. You, 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 well, you said like, Laura, you said like, this is what's the, what's the odds? <laughs> this is so crazy. He's currently, currently he is listed as the minus two. Sorry. I can't even read this number properly in terms of odds. <laughs> minus 2,499. Nice. Nice. Favorite over Brundage, who is the plus 1,128 underdog. Like, now, normally, so normally I would say like it's MMA. I'm putting some money on that shit. Cause you're going to 2000 times plus your money, however that works. Right. hundred percent. But I also, I train with a guy named Colin Moore who wrestled Bo Nickel twice and lost to Bo Nickel twice. We all know how technical and good that uh, Bo Nickel is, but Colin is equally technical and good. And I said, you know, and I talked to him one day and I said, man, you know, what happened? Like why, you know, why did Bo beach when Bo first started getting in May? Because I've been trying to convince Colin to get in May forever, but he's just not going to. And uh, I said, "Bro, get your your revenge on him. Like I'll teach you how to elbow him, you know, and you can you can beat Bo Nickel, right?" But he's not going anyway. And he said that he out muscled him. And Colin is one of the strongest guys I've ever met. Um, he's well known in the Ohio State room as being one of the stronger guys. When we go lift weights, I mean, half of the workout is taking the plates off so that I can do my. <laughs> So, I mean, this guy is an absolute brute machine and Bo Nickel doesn't look like a strong guy. I was so surprised when he said that because Bo Nickel isn't built like, you know, a machine, like a strong looking, like we know the strong wrestlers, like the Ferraris and, you know, the guys like that who, you know, they look strong. Bo doesn't look that way, uh, but he has all the technical skills. I think he's going to destroy Cody Brundage. And I think those are proper odds is what I'm getting at. Uh, and for those who don't know or don't follow college wrestling, Colin Moore wrestled 197 pounds at Ohio State. He was a, a national yeah. finalist a couple of times. So, and to be clear, and Bo, and Bo is fighting at 185. Colin is a natural 197 pound wrestler. To out muscle Colin Moore at 197 tells you how strong Bo Nickel must be. So I'm, listen, I'm with you. I think everyone here is be you. I mean, Laura, I'm not going to sit here and make you pick a fight, but I mean, I think we're all understand why Bo Nickel is favored to win this fight. I think we all probably imagine he's going to win this fight. But as I said, he can't just win this fight. He's got to go out there and do what the odds say he should do. He needs to go out there and have another two minute knockout submission. He needs to maul. Cody, mm. he can't win a 30, 27 decision and think that's going to, that's going to do well for him. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, the expectations are very high. He's got to go out there. He's got to do it and he's got to do it impressively. And I think that, you know, what we're all excited about is the next, the next step up for Bo. Like when he gets, yeah. when he gets a guy that as soon as we read the name, we go, Ooh, that's going to be a tough one. Right. Like that's, I think that's what the audience is looking forward to and maybe why, a few people are like, why is this on the main card? It's, you know, it, it does have to do with the odds in the matchup, but um, I don't know. He's got a bright future. That's for sure. I remember seeing him on the contender series and I was like, Oh shit. <laughs> I'm still putting 10 bucks on Cody Brown. It's just, a, <laughs> I'll put 10 you bucks. On. <laughs> I, I said, you weren't here, Matt. We opened the interview and I said, uh, I, I gave Laura her intro and I said, Alan Joe Band called her the unicorn. You really are. You did the contender series, you do the interviews over there. You do commentary now. Good <laughs> Lord. Like slow down. Some of us need jobs, Laura. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to stay busy at some point. I'm at some point. It's too much though. <laughs> um. All right. Before we get out of here, listen, to be honest, again, there's no fight that's really, truly slipping under the radar because every single fight on this card matters, ranked, former champions. Weirdly, I think you could argue that Yan Zhao Nan and Zhang Wei Li is like the most underrated fight on this card. And it's a freaking yep. event because no one's really buzzing about it. But 
Laura, I'll throw it to you first. What is the one fight at UFC 300 that maybe you're excited about that that isn't one of these main marquee fights? And again, I think we've talked about a lot in this card, but there's always, again, even on a card like this, like even like Jessica Andrade, Marina Rodriguez, we're not really talking about great fight. We're not really yeah. talking about it. So is there one fight on this card that like, you're excited about that maybe people aren't like, it's not one of the big headline fights? Yeah, I mean, Diego Lopez versus Sadiq Yusuf is going to be sick. It's going to be so good. I mean, Diego Lopez, both of those guys are nonstop action. Diego Lopez's uh, jiu-jitsu is insane. Sadiq Yusuf um, can knock about anybody out. That's a really, really fun matchup. Um, I hope I'm not overstepping uh, in saying this, but one of my biggest disappointments in UFC 300 is that we did not get Jim Miller versus Matt Brown. I said the same thing. <laughs> And I don't know why Thank it didn't you. happen. And you don't have to say why, but I just, I really wish that that would have happened. And I just wanted to tip my cap because that would have been fucking awesome. Well, Laura, we, you are closer to Dana than me. So give him a call <laughs> and be like, what the fuck? I'll still go. I'll still go out there and fight this weekend. Stay ready. Stay <laughs> ready. I'm ready. I'll, I'll, I'll jump on a flight right now. I matched, I matched made the hell out of that fight. Cause I had Jim on before and he mentioned Matt, obviously I do a podcast with Matt. So I was like matchmaking the hell out of that match. And then he called it him. It was out. like, it was it written was right in stars. Like it was the most obvious. I yeah, don't get me started. I, I was, I just, I got excited. Cause I just assumed because it was so obvious that it was going to happen, but we don't, I was, we don't I have to land actually, on a down. I was actually training for that fight. I thought, really? I thought it was that set. I, I was actually you know, I was watching video of Jim Miller, like, okay, you know, I started working with Southpaws. Like, I was ready, but, yeah, you know, I'm not the the king of this hill, so. Mm. And it's funny, too, because when I talked to Jim after the match got made, uh, this is the fourth time he's been matched with Bobby Green, and Bobby has dropped out of three other fights. They're all the way back to, like, 2014. They've been huh. matched, up like, three different times. And he said for the first time in his career when they called him, Jim asked, I, I can't remember if it was Sean Shelby or Mick Maynard. It was Dana was also on the line. They said Bobby Green 300. And he goes, really? Really? Because yeah. he got paranoid because Bobby's dropped out of three fights with him in the past. I was like, yeah, Matt Brown. Matt Brown's going to drag there with one leg if he needs to to fight. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, that's my... That's my biggest disappointment. Not that I, I want to end on a negative note. We can talk about something else, but I had, well, to, just, I had to get in there. In well, the positive note is that you didn't steal my fight that I was going to say <laughs> going under the radar. I don't know why no one's really mentioned it much, but this Jalen Turner, Hanato, McCoyno fight, Kano, however you, know, you say this motherfucker's <laughs> name. There you go. Um, that is a fucking war. I'm telling you right now, like – all these fights are good, probably going to be wars, right? There's a lot of them that are going to be knocked down, blood baths, and that's what we all like to see. But that one, I, I, I got a feeling that's going to be just, just a bloodbath, you know? I mean, God damn, that one just gets my dick hard. <laughs> yeah, I, told you to, too, <laughs> I told you you're allowed to curse on here. <laughs> uh that's such a wild fight too. Cause I mean, what Jalen did to Bobby green, like that was one of the scariest knockouts I've seen in like outside of maybe Josh Emmett and Bryce Mitchell. That was one of the scariest knockouts in recent history. And who doesn't love money Moicana? Who doesn't love that guy? Right. Like, yes, we all love him, but like, come on now. Who doesn't just wait for his post fight interviews now? A hundred percent. That guy, give that man a microphone more. I mean, the, now that he's finally learned how to speak English, it's like, Holy cow. We, what have we been missing this entire time? This kid's crazy. Yeah, because we know that the translator was saying some bullshit every time, right? Well, Connor yeah. was saying something awesome, and the translator is like, "Oh yeah, he said thank Jesus and yeah, and we you know thank Brazil and whatever." <laughs> it's uh, so for me, I'm gonna throw it out there because I listen just because I got to give the guys flowers. Jim Miller, I mean UFC 100, UFC 200, UFC 300. I'm a little biased because I've known Jim since literally the day he got in the UFC. What a dude. What a great guy. Like he is, he is the epitome of what this sport represents. Like he's like the nicest guy in the world. Savage in the savage in the cage, 40 years old, look better than ever. in his last, like he's like five and one in his last six, which is ridiculous. Bobby green's no joke, but man, like I like Bobby green. Let me be clear about that. I, I've known Bobby for a while, interviewed him a bunch of times, but like, is there a better feel good story that we're all kind of quietly rooting for than Jim Miller to get a win at 300? Like he's got a cap off the three cards. Like he's the only one to do it, but he's also the only one to win on all three. So that's a great, yeah, I, 
Yeah, I think I think we all are, uh, are are hoping that Jim has a has a good night. I love Bobby Green, but you, you got to pull for for Jim in the spot for sure. Yeah, but I'm with you, Laura. I'm biased. I wanted Jim Miller versus Matt Bronte. And I told both of them, I said, it breaks my heart because I love Jim. I do a podcast with Matt, one of my closest friends. And I'm like, it's going to break my heart that you're going to fight each other, but I want to see it. And then they they messed it up. I was like, come on, guys. Like We just gave it. We literally handed you the fight. I kind of right. thought that was what was beautiful about it because I like Jim Miller too. I literally yeah. met him um, like, a I don't know, a month or two before that we started talking about fighting each other. And like, he's cool as shit. I mean, of course, we all knew he was cool as shit, but, um, you know, I'm like sizing him up a little bit. He's sizing me up. And, you know, I think we'd be great buzz. I think we'd probably have a beer after or or whiskey or, you know, we do some stupid shit or something, but like, he's like, he's like the kind of dude I would hang out with for sure. You know? And, um, you know, we would probably love each other more because I think we'd be pretty bloody together too. I think, you know, that we'd take a beating from each other. So, you know, as long as he didn't choke me out, you know, he's pretty good at that. So, (laughs) well, that, that might be the only disappointment because otherwise this card is ridiculous. Laura, uh, before we get you out of here, you're going to be, you're doing the weigh-in show this week. What all you got going on? Yep, I'm doing the weigh-in show and some stuff backstage on a fight night. So a uh, little, little lighter lifting this weekend. I got my next commentary gig will be St. Louis. So getting geared up for that. Um, I say this cause we've said on the show, I'm not saying this cause like, you know, this is nothing we've said publicly, but I think you've become one of the absolute best commentators in the game. Oh, and I've watched you and evict and everything you've done, but, and I hear this and I, I know I had this conversation with Matt. I've had this conversation with Alan Joban on the show. Like you have become one of the best commentators in the game. And I look forward to every time you're calling fights and listen, I think the UFC has a tremendous commentary team. I love Joe. I love Daniel. I love Bisping, like all the guys, but you really have become a pro and I, I, I really do. And I sincerely mean this. Like, I hope you get to call more fights because I think you are fantastic at it and your breakdowns and your analysis are, are incredible. I just like, I think I think you are absolutely one of the best in the game. And I just, I'm so glad I was, I mean, I know I messaged you like right after it happened, but I was like so happy when you got your first gig. Yeah. Like, oh yes. Yeah, about time. Well, I appreciate that. That's, that's incredibly kind of you to say. And, and Matt has been incredibly kind uh for a long time about it too so i it means it means a lot to hear you guys say that and i yeah i just i love this sport and i work really freaking really fucking hard (laughs) to uh to represent the athletes the best that i can when they're out there fighting it just that means uh the most to me so thank you guys i appreciate you yeah i would agree i i gotta say too like you do a great job and keep it up and you know tells jamie barner to shove it up his ass <laughs> you can say it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got, we got your back, Laura. Laura, thank you appreciate for doing the show. We appreciate it. Enjoy uh, Vegas this weekend. Uh, weirdly, like I said, you're not doing quite as much, but I'm sure you'll find plenty to be busy with. So oh, there's thanks, lots. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for thanks for doing the show with us, and uh, come back and see us anytime. We'd love to have you on again. Would love to. I would lo- absolutely would love that. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Damon. Appreciate you guys. Thank you, Laura. Talk have a good night. Soon. Bye. Matt, that is our show. We will be back next week with another edition of the Fighter versus the Rider. Thanks for everyone tuning in, and we will see you then.